Yeah. <laughs> so that's going to be fun and exciting. So let me uh, uh, get Dennis Porter, Richard Jackson, Cody Carbone, and Scott Conger. Unless it's Carboni. I just, when I read it, I wanted it to be Cody Carboni, but Scott Conger. And uh, they're going to regulation of crypto from a city, state, and federal perspective. Dennis Porter is a CEO and co founder of Satoshi Action Fund, as well as the founder and president of Satoshi Action Education. Dennis believes in a methodical, bottom up approach to American politics. And Richard is an Oklahoma native. Richard Jackson currently serves as Deputy Attorney General for Cybersecurity Technology. That sounds like a big deal, so this is not my knife. Um, and digital assets in the state, acting as a subject matter expert on cybersecurity, policy, regulation, and compliance. And there's more to each of their bios, which you can get online if you have an hour to kill to read all these. Scott Conger was elected mayor of Jackson on June 18th. Is he here? Is Scott here? He's not. He's not. So Scott's not here, so we'll skip him. You don't get to get read about if you're not here. Cody Carbone is the Chief Policy Officer at the Chamber of Digital Commerce, the world's leading trade association representing the digital asset blockchain industry. Basically what you're going to hear, and the moderator will help you. Uh, Matthew Moore is our moderator. He'll help you get to know these guys, but you're going to hear from a world of expertise. And I'm not just stepping on their bios because they're long and they should have sent better emails. I'm, you know. <laughs> these guys know what they're talking about is the point. So let's welcome them back from lunch. Welcome them up here. Get up here, guys, and do your thing. And Matthew Moore is our, uh, wait, wait, where's Matthew Moore? <clears throat> oh, Matthew Moore, I got you confused okay. with the guy who already spoke. So no, Matthew no, Moore no, is a successful good. business owner. <laughs> hey, I thought good. it was the energetic, that's Nathan <laughs> Poole. I don't know why I made Nathan Poole and Matthew Moore the same person. Uh, uh, Matthew's a successful business owner, Amazon best-selling author, Bitcoin consultant, syndicated radio oh. host, and just a charming, sure. nice guy. Look how he handled not being introduced. You can tell he's a humble, <laughs> nice guy. Sure, sure, sure. All right, you guys have at it. That's All good. right, can you guys hear me? All right. Good, good. Well, this is, uh, this is a fun talk. Uh, government regulation and legislation. A lot has happened in 2024 and will continue to happen. Uh, but as the MC was saying, we've got uh, some great people here. Just real quickly, your own words. Each of you share what you're doing, who you are currently. Go first. Uh, hey everyone, Cody Carbone. I am the Chief Policy Officer at the Digital Chamber. We are a federal trade association representing companies in the digital asset space. So I work to educate and advocate members of Congress, the administration, everyone at the Washington level uh, representing companies in this space. Uh, Richard Jackson, Deputy Attorney General for the State of Oklahoma for Cybersecurity Technology and Digital Assets. So we're basically kind of the same thing, just as a effectively internal consultant to the Attorney General's office, working on regulation and policy around the three divisions that I work on, specifically here, digital assets. Uh, Dennis Porter, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Satoshi Action Fund. We do Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining policy across the country. Uh, we're the organization that's responsible for passing right to mine and uh, right to self custody bills into law in Oklahoma, yep. uh, yeah, Louisiana, Montana, and Arkansas. And we, uh, we pr predominantly focus on the state level because we want to see that bottom up approach to the political process. I love it. Well, if, uh, if me and RJ come off biased for Oklahoma, that's because we're from Oklahoma. So we're definitely going to toot our own horn. But uh, as a radio show host, I love getting to talk about legislation and what's going on. There's a lot of momentum, like I was saying. Uh, 2018, Caitlin Long, in my opinion, kind of really kicked things off in Wyoming when it comes to positive cryptocurrency legislation. Uh, 2019, I didn't have much success, but I was working with the state of Oklahoma and some of our lawmakers there. But it really wasn't until Dennis and Satoshi Action Fund came into the picture here in, this, or in the state of Oklahoma it seems like there's been a tidal wave of momentum after your Bitcoin rights bill went and was signed into law into the state of Oklahoma. So I kind of want to go down the line here because not only do we have legislation being passed in state governments, but we have political parties now implementing cryptocurrency ideas and, 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 and the language even found in, in your bill um, being implemented into the GOP. So um, whether it's a presidential campaign, a party, laws being passed, there's momentum. So in your guys' opinion, what is your take on this political momentum that's happening in the year 2024? Uh, are, we, are we kind of at a tipping point? 
I mean, I'll, I guess I'll start and go down the line here. Uh, and and d don't do yourself, you're not doing yourself enough uh, credit. I mean, we would not have been able to do what we did in Oklahoma if it wasn't for the groundwork that you laid there. I mean, just insane amounts of education um, and all of the content and media that you've done. So, I mean, big round of applause because he has really laid the groundwork for the state of Oklahoma to be successful. Um, Yes, there is a ton of political momentum for, for Bitcoin and digital assets and Litecoin as well. You know, you have now these Bitcoin rights bills being passed into law, which ultimately protect your right to self-custody. They protect your right to mine, your right to buy, sell, trade Bitcoin and digital assets. Uh, and that's important because w at, previous to, what, say, 2022, 2023, a lot of people, I would say, in America were of the opinion that the United States would not be in favor of digital assets. The United States would oppose things like Bitcoin. But it, it's bills like the, the Bitcoin rights bill in Oklahoma and, and in Louisiana that show that there is real political appetite to be able to protect this industry and to attract it to these various jurisdictions. So, yeah, we couldn't be more proud to get that codified into law uh, and start building that political momentum so we can start to see not only the state's lead, but also um, hopefully long term see a federal reaction to all that state work. Yeah. So, so I will say a, a yeah, we're going to probably echo ourselves quite frequently here, but I will say yes and why. Uh, so, so why has there been the traction kind of at the state level? And I think it's, it is a lot of the groundwork that has been done in starting the conversations with representatives, with uh, policymakers about how a digital asset, whichever one is your, of your preference, solves a problem that they have. So if it's a, if it's a, a rural uh, employment question, you can talk about how Bitcoin miners or proof of work miners will move into areas where as long as electricity is cheap and they have the opportunity to operate um, kind of unpestered by the government, they will go into those places. You talk about things like, uh, now that it's becoming more political, there are policy decisions that are being made that we can start, unfortunately, div picking sides of, of, of a policy uh, item. So that's really the, the, the why has 2024 kind of uh, been different from a 23 or 22, where it's been more of a anti 22, 23 was kind of like an anti-corruption or anti-criminal uh, activity. You either sort of picked which, that's, a, that's an easy pick. Now it's the, okay, how do we want to promote the industry? And now you're saying, well, are we wanting to be kind of small grassroots? Are we wanting to be more of a federal level? And so people are starting to pick. And that's, that's the yes, it's yeah. been, you know, there is traction, the why now. I'm going to try to wrap everything that you guys said into how it's motivated at the federal level because I think all of it resonates. Um, the state's moving, and they always move more quickly than the federal level, but it creates a momentum where you've got members of Congress and you've got the administration for the first time taking a look and what's happening at the state level saying, I need to act because I'm hearing about it from my constituents. So states moving moves members of Congress, which is great. So it builds momentum at the federal level. I think just naturally given the time period since we've had some massive market failures in this space. Um, things have changed, where the perception of digital assets and Bitcoin on Capitol Hill and in Washington has changed. You have to remember that these members in Congress and the administrators themselves are focused on a whole litany of issues. And so their education is usually very small when it comes to digital assets. And we're working to build that and to grow that education. And so usually when they think of Bitcoin or Litecoin or any digital asset in this space, they usually tie it to some big market headline. And unfortunately, the market headlines in 2022 and 2023 were overwhelmingly negative. Now that time has passed, and some of that has started to thaw, we've done what you've said in some of that education where we've talked about, okay, we're not gonna talk about the technology anymore because it goes right over people's heads. You know, we're talking to some members of Congress, United States Senate who are 80, 90 years old. I mean, a lot of this stuff for me is a foreign language. And so we've gone in, I think, for a decade, and we started talking about the technology, and we brought in developers. And that's great, and they're, they're brilliant, and we need them in this space. But when you're talking to members of Congress, and you want them to get, down, get them on your side to pass policy, you have to frame it exactly as you said it is. Here's X problem, and here's how this technology solves it. And so we started framing our advocacy conversations and our education conversations about, around use cases. And I think that's made a dramatic difference, and it's why we've seen the momentum, in addition to what the states have been doing, carry over into Washington at the federal level. Well, whether it's, tr yeah, yeah, good, give me a round of applause. You can give me a round of applause. <laughs> yeah, whether it's true or not, Dennis, I'm still going to give you credit. President Trump came out shortly after and was super pro crypto and Bitcoin after the Oklahoma stuff went through. So I'm super excited that we have a jurisdiction 
Uh, you know, we have it in Louisiana, Montana, Arkansas as well, you know, similar language in these bills that have, that yeah. have gone and been signed into law. Uh, the idea to have your rights secured by the state government, I mean, you have that right intuitively, but for the government to come in and say, hey, if anything happens here in this jurisdiction, you've got the right to self-custody, you've got the right to mine, and uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear your perspective on all this work that you've been doing with Satoshi Action Fund, because these bills have been somewhat similar, if not identical. Share with us, A, have you found a template that works when working with state governments, and, and B, the ones that have been passed and signed into law, how different are they from each other? Yeah, I mean, it really just depends on the appetite of the lawmaker. So what we do is we try to find lawmakers that are already have a propensity to be favorable towards the legislation or because they maybe they they maybe they tried a Bitcoin or blockchain related bill in the past. Maybe they're tweeting friendly about digital assets. That's a really, you know, sort of key indicator of whether they're going to have that support there. So um, finding those lawmakers is, is critical. But kind of going back to something that Cody said, which is that talking about the benefits is a really, really big part of this process. You know, you can you can you you can explain Bitcoin and Litecoin and digital assets till you're blue in the face from a technological perspective. But until they really understand the value add to them and to their state, that's going to be, it's going to be very difficult for them to get on board with wanting to pass legislation. So we love to focus on how uh, proof of work mining can be able to provide rural jobs, how it can balance the grid, how it can mitigate methane emissions, how it can create rural jobs, as well as how it can also enhance uh, renewables. You know, renewables have this really big problem on the grid. They, they are an intermittent energy asset. And so uh, that means that they're not an on-demand on power asset. So whenever they're producing excess energy, there's nobody there to buy it, right? And so Bitcoin miners, digital asset miners can come in and they can buy up that excess energy, which is huge because right now a lot of those renewable energy assets rely on government subsidies. So uh, digital asset mining can move the renewable energy sector away from the need to be dependent on these types of subsidies. And, and lawmakers, they know that they, they intuitively know when you say that digital asset mining can do all of these great things they, they hear that and they go, oh, I want those things. They're not, like, you don't have to convince them. Yeah. Uh, so that's a big part of the process is talking about the benefits of Bitcoin and digital assets. So uh, I love the fact that, was it the Louisiana bill that had the anti-central bank digital currency provision in there? Yeah. I wish we had gotten that one through yeah, Oklahoma. Yeah. Oh, but, the, yeah, the, but, part, <laughs> the part about the difference, yeah, it just really depends on the appetite of the lawmaker, but the governor in Louisiana is very anti-CBDC, so he was very excited about that <laughs> okay. part coming, getting passed in a law. All right, so yeah, you can massage it here and there as you're working with it, okay. Yeah. Um, all right, well, this next question is gonna be for RJ. Um, RJ, to date, this space has arguably been known to not be that, not, not it hasn't been regulated very well, as some would, as some would put it. Um, however, there have been many state and federal laws that have been heard, as well as several legal battles in the recent months. Um, knowing this, you know, plus the shift of oversight post Chevron, uh, what does the next few years look like, and how would you best prepare for that with somebody who is kind of in your position? Yeah, so let's let's level set on what we're talking about. We're really talking about kind of the regulatory landscape and kind of situational awareness for people who would want to promote digital assets in their jurisdiction or their usage or protecting a right. Uh, so Chevron was a court case in the 1970s that said that where there is a, uh, an uncertainty in a law, the courts must defer to, to federal agencies on what that rule means. Well, that has been struck by the most recent Supreme Court. And what they've effectively said is now we are having to redefine executive agency oversight of any asset or, or any industry. Talking here specifically, right, that's, that's the SEC and the CFTC as they may want to regulate digital assets. What the Supreme Court has effectively said is that we're not going to defer where there's uncertainty anymore, or you don't have to. So that really kind of kicks it back into the work that we're talking about doing is now working with legislators about saying, well, if, there is not a, if there's not certainty, legislators are going to have to be the ones that make the clarity. Otherwise... We the, we, the courts, are going to, to operate. So you're in a whole new regulatory landscape than you haven't been in the last 40 years. So everything that we know about digital assets regulation up until maybe about two or three weeks ago is now back on the table for, for redefining. So what, what would we do here? How does that affect things? Well, you're seeing a lot of the Supreme Court cases say, or a lot of other legal cases come out and say, a lot of these rules are very arbitrary. We're not sure you guys know what you're talking, you, the regulator, know what you're talking about, or if you do make a decision that they're very well grounded in reason. So all of this comes back in to, to say that 
the, the digital asset industry, we in the industry, I'm going to call myself we in the industry, we in the industry are now in a whole new regulatory environment where you have a very significant opportunity for a limited window of time to be much more impactful in about the future of a direction in a jurisdiction. So going to state legislators who move faster than the federal government and say, tell us what you think the future is. What is, what is your plan? What are your positions? I, your constituency, want to know. Showing up in person is better than talking on the phone. Talking in the phone is better than email, but engaging. And you'd be surprised how low the bar is. One conversation or two emails or a few people, and they, will, they legislators, will start asking staff, what do I need to know about this? As, as Cody mentioned, they're very, very thin on a lot of things, but if you're making an engagement it's important, they will start going. So that's... In a broad sense, I would say now until probably 2025 when the, legis the new federal legislature starts acting on some of the opportunities that they've had with FIT21 or SAB121 being kind of re-looked at, is to, you can make a lot more progress in the next six months than you probably could have since uh, this became a, a thing to discuss. So it's wide open fields, whoever runs the fastest, whoever sprints. Go to your, rep your representatives or your policymakers with the use cases and say, look, this is what Litecoin does. These are the reasons why we want to be interested. I know you hear a lot about Bitcoin and the savings technology. Let me talk to you about all the things that, that we know with Litecoin and why you, a representative, want to be a representative center, whoever is a policymaker, you want to be educated on this piece, and here's the reasons why. And that's, that's really what I'd say is, you know, you're in a new regulatory environment, and it's a great opportunity to engage with policymakers and decision makers on advancing the industry forward because they're going to have more questions uh, than they've ever had and time to think about it because they're going to have to. Yeah. It, let me add one thing because I, I think it's important to drive home. The digital asset industry right now is regulated. The problem is that it's imperfect. So, you know, by show of hands, how many of you buy your digital assets, whether it's, it's Litecoin, Bitcoin, on a centralized exchange? Coinbase, Kraken, Strike, any of those. Those are regulated at the state level right now with money transmitter licenses, and they're regulated at the federal level as money service businesses under FinCEN. And so I think you know, we have to start the conversation there that this isn't just some crazy wild west that is completely unregulated, that are, there has been checks and balances for so long. Unfortunately, there's been a lot of efforts to hinder the use of this technology in the United States through over and excessive, overburdensome and excessive regulations. But I, we want to start there because I think there's misconceptions abound that we are just operating in a complete wild west and this, and this industry does not want to be regulated. That's just not true. Well, I'm still going to hold on to my six shooter just in case. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, Cody, to that point, I, I want to, uh, this next question I'm going to throw to you. Uh, 2024, I would argue, is probably one of the first years that cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Litecoin, the digital asset space in general has become mainstream in the political process as far as the conversation goes. And you spend a lot of time in Washington, D.C. Um, one thing that I've always kind of, you know, looked at, and I know it's been brought up before in the space, you know, the way that our government uh, regulates and taxes this asset class the idea behind Litecoin and Bitcoin is obviously to be this peer-to-peer -peer form of money, hard, sound money, um, but we have capital gains tax, right? So if, if there's capital gains tax at the federal or state level, um, it kind of hinders that idea of it being used for a medium of exchange. What is, your, what is your take on this? Do you see capital gains tax eventually being removed, or is this going to force the, the space to become something that maybe it wasn't designed to become? It's a great question. Um, I think right now classifying Bitcoin and some of the other digital assets as property and thus having that capital gains is a barrier to adoption right now because it just makes it so much harder for, you, for me to use my Bitcoin or Litecoin if I want to go buy a cup of coffee or you know, go purchase a, a vehicle. Um, and so we, there needs to be some kind of uh, treat or fix to the tax treatment of those assets. I think that conversation is still very early going as, as a, in Washington right now. We are just starting to have the conversation about how to treat Bitcoin when it's mine, those Bitcoin, those block rewards, treating them right now, not only, right now they're treated as income when you receive the reward, and then you're, so you're taxed on that, and then you're also taxed when you try to sell that. 
That's double taxation. We're trying to fix that right now. I know Dennis has been very active in like the Jarrett case in the courts on trying to fix that. And so we're very, very early in the conversation on tax as it relates to digital assets. Most of the conversation thus far in Washington has been on just token designation. What is a security? What is a commodity? I'm sure everyone, if you're following the space, has heard about the the battles this industry has gone up against uh, against Gary Gensler. And so that has been the main focus. I think as this conversation becomes more political, and now that we're having the conversation at the top of the ticket, and you know, to all of your credit, you know, the fact that we have it as part of the GOP party platform is incredible. We can start to now have those conversations about tax. We can start to move away just from the, the SEC, CFTC conversation and start to realize that this asset class is here to stay. Unfortunately, in Washington, we've been fighting just to exist for so long, and so we haven't been able to have those other, other battles. We're getting there, and so I imagine the 119th Congress getting sworn in in January 2025, those conversations on the tax treatment of Bitcoin and Litecoin and other assets will be right at the forefront. Before we move on, do you guys want to add anything to that? Oh, I just think that it's super important to begin the process of eliminating capital gains uh, tax. You know, we at Satoshi Action, we have model policy that eliminates, begins that process at the state level through a de minimis exemption, and it is one of the pieces that lawmakers have not picked up yet. So our, our bill has a suite of different options that, that lawmakers can participate in uh, or include in their, their bills when they introduce them. That's one of them. But I do agree with Cody, the momentum is changing. And as we get momentum at the federal level on some of this more basic market structure stuff, uh, that is going to lead to broader conversations on how do we truly unlock the potential of digital assets. Uh, right now, digital asset purchases are very, extremely limited by tax liability. Every time you buy a, a coffee, every time you buy your groceries, it's a taxable event. And that really just crushes the ability to use digital assets as a form of money. Uh, so we want to see that completely removed. And we're happy to be starting it at the state level. Ultimately, it's really going to be, that one's going to be on the federal level, though. I mean, there are state cap gains, but you know, the federal level cap gains is the real, uh, the real issue. I know Senator Lummis is also working on the de minimis as well. She's, she's included it in some of her legislation, legislative efforts. So there is an interest in moving this forward. It just comes down to how, you know, how much can we get done over the next five years as this political momentum begins to shift. And it very much has shifted. We've moved for, away from a world where we're saying like, what can we do to regulate this stuff? What can we do to crush it? You know, this is a broader conversation towards, you know, how can we actually unlock the potential of this technology and ensure that Americans can benefit from it? Uh, you know, getting rid of cap gains is one. I think getting a Bitcoin strategic reserve is a, another big win for the, uh, the win for America, win for our country, and we, I think that's something that we should absolutely pursue. But there are a number of different things that we should pursue from a policy perspective that will truly unlock the potential of digital assets in Bitcoin. And so I'll echo a previous answer and say that this is a perfect, perfect test case for, you know, for example, earlier today there was a presentation on Litecoin being a reward for, uh, you know, your cell phone bill. So going to your, your congressman or your senator or at the state level, I think, is where we would say you're going to get the most traction as early as possible. But to say, hey, look, I pay my cell phone bill in Litecoin. I'm being double taxed for this. That Depending on your jurisdiction, that's a very easy, bright line political argument to make to say, I should not have my money taxed twice. I should not have an income taxed twice. What is your policy stance on double taxation, and how do you plan to rectify it? I know in Wyoming there already exists, uh, you know, discussion about a de minimis exemption. Are we considering that here? Would you consider that here? I promise you, the first thing that will come after that conversation is one: let me do more research on this, and then a staff, a staffer, or an aide calling somebody like a Dennis or a Cody, going, "Hey, we're getting asked about this. What should we do?" And the next thing you know, there's a, a, an Oklahoma House Bill 3594 that protects your right to own digital assets. And then there's an amendment that adds in a de minimis exemption for income tax. And it just that's how the process rolls, is that these little use cases that are very easy, bright line, political discussions, I should not be taxed twice, that then leads to more and more and more integration of digital assets into just kind of everyday uh, discussions, and then we just build from there. Well said, well said, you guys. <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna take this conversation now towards an area where those who have been in kind of this mainstream thinking about money and privacy, uh, illicit activities, you know, there's things that are keywords that may trigger people, but the root genesis idea behind Bitcoin and things like Litecoin was was obviously to have this kind of peer-to-peer. Uh, decentralized money system that was separated or divorced from the government, separation of state and money, right? 
but now there's, you know, obviously big concerns in the space towards the idea of fungibility and privacy. Yes, they are public ledgers. Yes, you, you may not have a, a name sometimes directly associated to a, a wallet address, but there are attempts to blacklist UTXOs, blacklist uh, certain you know, coins because they were used in illicit activities. So in order for something to be a good form of money, we do need that level of fungibility and, and privacy. I mean, just because a dollar was used in illicit activity, we don't really complain. We're still going to use that dollar. You know, it's still going to have the same purchasing power. It's not like the government goes through and marks a little black mark on this piece of paper. Uh, but but my, my, my question to you is with projects like uh, Litecoin adding protocols like Mimblewimble to help improve privacy and fungibility. Do you see governments and regulators responding to these improvements in a good way? Do they, do they try to go after it? Do they try to stop it? Or do they just let it go because it's going to happen anyways? Depends on the regulator. You talk okay. About. <laughs> All right. um, I, well, I want to say first and foremost, and this is a how I start every conversation like this when I'm talking to a policymaker in DC. Privacy is not secrecy. That there is a right to privacy. And that, that is something that every member of Congress, every policymaker should get behind. That you have a right to privacy in your financial transactions. I think the conversations around illicit finance get so overblown and, and are somewhat silly because as you mentioned, Matt, I mean, the, this is on a public ledger. And if you're gonna commit a crime on, on the blockchain, it, it really is, is the dumbest thing you could do because for law enforcement, that is the easiest to track. This conversation around privacy is, is really interesting as it relates to Washington right now. So there has been a huge effort from the current administration, I would say Democrats in Congress, not all Democrats in Congress, but, but some, um, to really prohibit the use of this technology in the United States because they are worried that it's helping um, conceal illicit activity because of that privacy nature. This, the ethos of this technology being built outside of government control scares the hell out of them because their whole ethos is that government is the great equalizer. That more government is the best thing that they can offer to citizens. And that means more financial regulatory control and more government um, oversight into your day-to-day -day transactions and activity. And so they are extremely resistant to any conversation around privacy when we talk about it in this space. Now, not all members of Congress are like that, and it is not necessarily a partisan issue. So we just have to get better about how we talk about privacy. We have to talk about, like we have to talk about in every conversation as it relates to this technology, why it's essential, why it's important, why I don't wanna see it if I'm gonna get my paycheck in Bitcoin, why I don't necessarily want that to be seen everywhere on the public ledger. Why, if I'm going to donate to a, a certain political candidate, why it makes sense that it's not necessarily can be seen by everyone. There are real use cases out there of why this is important. It's communicating through those use cases instead of just starting with, we want privacy. It just, it, it just doesn't work right now. So it, it, boil it down, it does go down like, to the regulator, um, but we need to get more sophisticated on how we're having the conversations as well. I would, I would say that this is one of the great uh, great opportunities for an industry that can be as quantitative as digital assets is to be able to demonstrate with reports, with uh, with studies, with you know all the things that we're capable of doing, uh, with either public blockchain information or aggregated studies that you, you know you produce to first clarify the issue and say. Well, in the worst case, or as it is currently used, let, let's address your concerns about illicit finance. Or, and, and that's where you see reports coming into like Congress, where there was accusations about terrorist financing, that it was all flowing through digital assets. Well, the industry responded with reports to say, actually, we know where it came from, and we know what percentage of funding was coming from these sources that you've alleged, right? very broad brushstroke political statements, that then you counteract with factuals. And so that's, that's where I would start with, is by level setting the person that you're talking with, meet them where they are by saying, let's, let's, um, let's answer some of your concerns, let's address some of your fears by showing you what's really happening here and, and then to move the conversation forward. Because again, it's one of these where the technology, conversations about the technology are further along uh, down the road than, the industry is further along than your policymakers are. So, so don't try to drag them into conversations about Mimblewimble versus any other type of implementation. Uh, it's just, 
they'll get lost in the sauce, and, and for the most part, uh, the answer tends to be no unless you can tell me there's no risk in saying yes, which is not where you want to be. Just so start with start with what you know um, and, and show it to them and meet meet your regulator where they are. Talk with them, have conversations in that sense. Any thoughts, Dennis, or you want me to move on? Digital assets are terrible for crime. <laughs> okay, good. That's well said. All right, let's go from here. Uh, so we've got probably about four minutes left. Uh, currently, the United States federal government is the third largest holder of Bitcoin. Um, it's been rumored that uh, President Trump may be announcing this week that if elected president again, that he has a plan to potentially use Bitcoin as a reserve asset for the United States. Uh, if this were to happen, in my opinion, this would be monumental. Uh, can you each explain to us your thoughts around this? What are the implications? If that happens, and, and we don't know yet. This is just this rumor, okay? It's a very big rumor. Very um, big rumor. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can see that the, you know, the media clearly thought uh, this was a very interesting idea. You know, you had Fox News, uh, CNBC, as well as you know, dozens of other outlets reporting on the potential for Trump to announce a Bitcoin strategic reserve. Uh, I, I think, honestly, this is a, is a really smart play. I think it's a smart move because we already sit on 210,000 Bitcoin, and all we would need to do is direct the U.S. Marshals to convert that into a strategic reserve. Now, how that's implemented, uh, there's a number of different ways that you can approach it, everything from an exchange stabilization fund to mimicking something very similar to the petroleum reserve to the way that we handle gold. Like, There's a, a sort of varying theories on how to approach it. I think that it's obvious that if we're already sitting on 210,000 Bitcoin, that we should obviously hold on to that Bitcoin. I mean, I don't think anybody in this room would disagree with that. So how that gets it, how that, yeah, Germ yeah I heard the Germany, Germany comment. Germany's yeah. sweating right now. <laughs> uh, probably the, that's going to go down as one of the worst, uh, worst trades in, in Bitcoin's history. So big supporter of this process, a big supporter of anybody that wants to promote this idea. And I think that there is clearly a lot of, interest in moving it forward. And you know, at Satoshi Action, we're going to be actively engaged in helping to drive those conversations forward. I would, I would take it less of a let's, let's not prognosticate on the future of this or that. I take it more in the general sense of this is an atmospheric. This is another data point to tell you kind of where the traction, where the industry is in terms of the traction that it's getting at the national level, at the state level, wherever. Well, if you're having a top of the ticket political candidate for president, even to be rumored to discuss a concept like a strategic digital asset reserve, is that lets you know kind of your, your left and rights with how you can communicate to your more local representatives. Again, the action, the, the, the speed of, of, of engagement and traction is going to happen at the state level. So if you can then go to, if you are particularly in a uh, more red-leaning state, if you have a Republican president can, presidential candidate talking about Bitcoin strategic reserve is that's when you engage with their political party about the values and the use cases of Litecoin, of digital assets in general. And this is, again, it's, it's less about does it happen or doesn't it? It's just a data point in kind of the general situational awareness to go, okay, now, now is a great time while there's a conversation at the national level, now through November or announcement, that you, uh, that you, can, make the, you can make the case for why the things that you are, are interested in digital assets coming true. Cody, one minute. It's a great policy play. Let's, let's see. <laughs> I, I, I would echo everything that's been said. It's a fantastic policy play. It, I think it's common sense uh, to what Dennis said of you know all the Bitcoin we currently have. Um, let's see what Vice President Harris does. Yeah. yeah. Let's see if she does the same thing. Well said. Well, guys, we got 30 seconds. Any closing thoughts, th closing words? Engage with your policymakers. Um, the amount of times I go into a conversation in Washington and I have a member of Congress tell me, I'm not interested in, in this because I'm not hearing from my constituents about it. That's what they pay attention to the most, is those phone calls and those letters that go into their office. You may think that they're, they're a waste of time. They listen to those and they respond to those. Policymakers care about being reelected. And so what drives them is what their constituents care about. Reach out. To your, to your policymakers if you care about this technology because it truly can move the needle. And I would say whatever you're thinking about doing at the federal level, you have a better chance of success at the state level and it will also move faster. So exactly what Cody said, just also engage at the state level because that's really where kind of things are going to happen. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, that final point there on the, you know, engaging with the lawmakers is critical. You know, if you are not engaged and you're not having conversations with them, they're not going to be paying attention to the issue. You know, if you are, but also, there's a couple different things here I think that are important is if you, if you're like, I hate politics, I want nothing to do with politics, you know, find someone that is engaged in the space, you like what they're doing and work to support their efforts. I know that politics for some is a little bit of a difficult arena. So if you don't want to be in that arena, there's plenty of people that are willing to help you sort of expand your voice. I would definitely find ways to reach out to those groups. All right. Cody, RJ, Dennis, it's been great. Thanks for chatting with us. Thank, Thank you. you.